So welcome, uh, welcome everyone for, um, um, and excited that you're all joining this, uh, this uh, webinar today. Um, we have a special guest, uh, James Fulton, and I will introduce James a little bit later. Um, I want to um, remind you, and I know a number of you are dialing in almost uh, every month, um, that this webinar is recorded and will be posted. So um, for those of us who cannot join live, they can uh, watch the, the webinar later. Um, um, I will start briefly with um, uh, talking about a few things related to learning and development, leadership development. Um, and one of the things that um, you know we have uh, in place, and you have signed up for this uh, today through our Center for Corporate Learning Innovation. Um, so we have some news about our uh, Center for Global Center for Corporate Learning Innovation, and I will turn it over to Christina to uh, briefly uh, share actually what we do and what is the news about what we do. Thanks so much, Nick. Yes, in fact, we have some exciting news. We launched the center, you know, like one year and a half ago, and we are taking it to the next level. And uh, we are doing it uh, by adding in-depth knowledge about human resources. And its new name is going to be the Center, the I Center for Corporate Learning and Human Resources. What is actually quite well linked to today's sessions as our keynote speaker, James Fulton, is basing his work on talent development, human resources development, and leadership development and Goldman Sachs. So we hope that you will join us along this second path. And uh, I will be posting right now where you can see the session once recorded. Thank you, Nick. Welcome, James. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christina. Um, and yeah, in terms of um, one other announcement is that um, some of you know, and I know there are some alumni as well today uh, on, uh, on the webinar, um, we will uh, launch the fifth edition of the Global Masterclass L&D Leadership in July. Um, so this is a very exciting program for um, um, professionals in uh, learning and development, leadership development, HR. Um, typically from the corporate world, uh, but also we have about uh, one third of the candidates who are joining us from, um, uh, from vendors, uh, consulting firms who are involved in learning and development and, and leadership development. Um, this is a, um, you know, every program, every edition is a new edition uh, based on the latest insights in terms of design, feedback from the previous cohort and our next cohort uh, will start with a six month learning journey. Um, it's a complete online program uh, with a number of different elements when it comes to online. Uh, and there's an optional uh, two and a half day retreat at the end and that will be in the Alps in Germany in uh, February 2022. So um, a very exciting program. We have uh, 30 uh, candidates confirmed for the program. Uh, we are still accepting uh, a few more. Um, and um, if you are interested, or some of you are interested in this program, you might uh, you might share this. And if you would like to know more about this program, uh, please feel free to uh, connect with my colleague uh, Patricia Garcia um, at IE University. And this is a joint program with Nine Road University in the Netherlands and IE University in Spain. So um, so again, if you are interested, uh, please feel free to connect with us, and we look forward. Um, uh, you know, seeing you potentially. Uh, and finally, um, you know, we run web monthly webinars. Um, and the next webinar is a webinar that I will deliver. Um, and the topic is, you know, why do most leadership development programs fail? Um, you know, I recently read a report from the Financial Times, um, a survey among uh, chief learning officers globally. Uh, and one of the, the number one, well, the number one priority in terms of development is leadership development. Uh, and I like to share some of the insights uh, from a book that I uh, have been co-authored with a number of my colleagues and partners at McKinsey. Uh, uh, it's called Leadership at Scale. Um, and reflecting on why do leadership, a lot of leadership programs fail. And of course, what's important for all of us, what can you do about it, right? So how can you design and deliver uh, programs that really add value. So I look forward to uh, seeing a number of you um, at uh, the next um, you know, webinar. 
And, and with that, um, I will stop sharing uh, my slides and uh, give James the opportunity. This is, when did she make this? To, um, to do this? It's not Badila, no? It's not Somebody cool. is on mute. It's not on mute. So maybe uh, if someone can unmute the, the person, wow. that would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, um, let me introduce uh, James. Uh, James, if you've seen from the invitation, is the um, uh, will deliver um, his presentation on developing talent at Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, um, David has a fantastic uh, education background. Um, he started um, with a um, master in arts uh, in classics from Oxford. Um, he completed his uh, MBA from INSEAD, uh, both in, in Hong the Singapore campus and the French campus. And he has studied also um, uh, psychotherapy, uh, counseling psychology, and executive education. And it is, you know, for those of us who are in learning and leadership development, just an example, uh, you are David, uh, James, uh, where, you know, this whole, our discipline, if we think about learning and leadership development is so broad, there's so much to learn, right? On every uh, topic, you can go so deep. So that's very exciting. Um, now, um, James is um, head of uh, talents and, and chief learning officer, as uh, Christina referred to, he's also overseeing recruitment, learning, uh, leadership development, and talent management. So the entire kind of almost the entire uh, uh, cycle in, in talent management. Um, prior to um, uh, Goldman Sachs, he has been with um, the Mission Medicine Group uh, with Stanton Morris. Uh, so a very rich career in, in our field. Um, and I'm also very excited that um, uh, uh, James is champion and managing director of the LQBT um, Q, uh, network. Um, so also very important, and thank you also for sharing that, uh, that James. So, um, and with that, James, I like to turn it over to you. Uh, I know you have a short presentation, and then what we will do um, is um, everyone in the session today, uh, please use the chat uh, for any comments, uh, but also uh, include a number of questions because it will be a short presentation, and then we will have a Q&A I have a couple of questions for James, but of course, I invite everyone to uh, uh, to join me in asking questions. So, uh, James, uh, the floor is uh, yours, and I'm delighted again that you um, are willing uh, and here today with us to uh, share your wisdom, your insights in developing developing talent at, uh, at an amazing firm, Goldman Sachs. Well, Nick, thank you for such a generous introduction, and thank you to you and Christina and Gemma for this wonderful invitation. Can I just check? Can you hear me and can you see the slides on screen? Yeah, okay, great. I really am touched to be in the presence of, you know, learning professionals. Um, I, I always think, you know, in a way, <laughs> by definition, our job is curiosity. And so to spend time speaking with you and more importantly for me, learning from you is a real pleasure. So thank you so much. Um, as well as that very formal bio, I thought I should just introduce myself as me, as James, and talk a bit about how I got in the field before we jump into my more formal remarks. I come from a family of teachers and doctors, and so the work that we do, uh, and I'm assuming the work that we're all collectively involved in on this call, for me is as much a vocation as it is a job. Um, it's something I feel very passionately about. Learning is many things. It's, it's one of which is it's a value. You know, to believe in the, the, the learning as a value itself. And so um, I love the field that we're in. Uh, I think it's extremely valuable for reasons that I'm gonna speak about. And it, I, I started my career, as you mentioned, Nick, as a strategy consultant, but I soon became curious about why is it that the clients are not doing the things that they should do? And that was in my twenties. Uh, and that question takes you into the realm of how do organizations work and more importantly, how do they learn? And, and so that's how I got into this field. It was rather a circuitous route, but I got, got into the field and, and here I am today. So what I thought I would do is um, not in fact, give you an advertisement about all the wonderful things that Goldman Sachs does. I'm happy to do that if that's of interest. And if, if, if in the questions you ask for the advert, I will give you the advert. But I thought I'd start actually um, by, talking about, uh, by talking about Joseph Joubert, who is a French essayist from the 18th century, 
who said, who has a quote that I, I quote often, which is to teach is to learn twice. And it's something I feel very strongly um, about. And I thought that actually your invitation, Nick, uh, was an opportunity for me to learn and specifically to learn about what's it been like for me to be a chief learning officer of a global corporation and what have I learned? And by the way, what am I still learning with? And what am I, excuse me, what am I still learning about? And so I thought that I'd frame some opening remarks actually around, around that notion. And so on the left-hand side, you'll see we've italicized the learning bit of a chief learning officer. What am I learning? What, do I, what am I in the process of learning and what am I wondering about? And I thought that I would share five things that, that, that I'm learning about that are on my learning agenda, which thanks to you, I've been able to articulate in this way. And I thought I'd speak for, let's say, 10 or maybe 15 minutes at the outside. And then I'd love to get into a dialogue uh, with you about either anything that I've said or anything that we do at Goldman or indeed anything at all in the world of learning. Because I, I um, um, and the five things are these. Firstly, the three buckets. I think what I'm really learning about with the role of being a chief learning officer, I think there are, there are at least three things that, that are important. The strategy, which I've been really thinking about. So what is the mindset that organizations have around learning and what is learning for? There's clearly execution and there's a huge um as you know array of articles around how do you make learning effective so i want to share just one idea around execution that i'm playing with that we're playing with the goldman and then i want to talk about the politics of being a chief learning officer for me politics has become one of these words it's being captured by the dark side politics is a bad word i actually i want to reclaim it as more of a neutral word and i want to talk i want to talk about and think about politics as the art of making things happen in organizations and I want to think about two aspects of being a, of the politics of being a chief learning officer that I'd like to share with you. And this is not, by the way, I want to be clear, this is not a job description of a CLO. It's got nothing about people leadership. It's got nothing here about digital. Many of the most important aspects of being a CLO are absent from this page. Again, I'm happy to go into any and all of that in the questions. I thought I would share with you my own you know, reflections on being a CLO, what I have learned. And so there, there are these five things. The reasons I'm going to keep my remarks quite short is that I strongly believe with John Dewey, who said the person doing the most talking is doing the most learning. And I'm rather selfish when it comes to learning. And so I'd rather not talk for too long. Uh, maybe you would not want to talk for too long as well. Maybe we have a shared interest in that. Um, but I really do believe this. And so, again, thank you for inviting me to learn, which I've done already in preparation for these talks. But that's why I'm going to keep my remarks to 10, 10 or 15 minutes. So we're going to go through those five things. I'm going to share a slide or two, an idea or two on each of those, and then, then we, can, we can dive in. So let's, let's dive in. So the first is mindset. You know, mindset is one of the trendiest concepts, as we know, in, in the field of learning. Growth mindset, as, as we know, by Carol Dweck has become, you know, I think a staple of many leadership and management programs. The contention that I have, having worked in learning now for several years, is that most uh, and by the way, I, sh I should say I worked at Goldman for 10 years. And before that, as Nick mentioned, I was an external management consultant. So I've worked in the fields of different industries, different countries. My contention is that most organizers, most CEOs, most leaders have a fixed mindset when it comes to learning. So ironically, we need to apply the very thing that we teach to others to our own function. And I think that we in learning have rather have at our best an expansive view but I think that those who commission our work, those who sponsor our work, have rather a fixed mindset. And so the first idea I want to share with you is that actually, I think we should be developing a growth mindset around learning, around what learning is. And when I say we, I, I primarily mean that the leaders whom we serve, the leaders whom we serve in our functions. And on the left hand side, you'll see a set of, let's call them assumptions, that most people would agree with when it comes to learning. Oh yeah, learning's about skills. It's about improving individuals. Learning's a reward for high potential talent. It's about programmatic delivery. You have learning experts in the learning function. And actually it's primarily a cost center. It's not, it doesn't generate revenue, it's a cost center. So and I think if you said those to many C, uh, chief executives, they, they wouldn't argue at all with any of them. I think it's, I think what our job as learning professionals is to develop a growth mindset and frame learning in a different way. Not to say that the assumptions on the left are incorrect, but to say that actually learning is broader. In my opinion, learning is a strategic capability and the source of competitive advantage. Uh, advantage. And so we need to conceive of what learning is differently. 
think instead of, or as well as being about skill building for individuals, it's actually a problem solving methodology. So learning can be used to solve strategic problems. Learning, in my view, could and should be a, a board level discussion. What are we learning? How do we learn quicker than our competitors? How do we learn more effectively than our competitors? Yes, it's a reward for hypos, but actually if we apply learning across the organization, it's a huge source of energy and momentum, particularly for driving change and innovation. Yes, learning can be programmatic, but it can also be process driven, actually. Learning can drive improvement at work by redesigning the processes. The way we work can be the subject of a learning intervention. And yes, learning expertise is important, but actually those that cultivate or develop learning can also be change makers and experts who can challenge the way the organizations work. And then lastly, as I, as I said, I, I, in my view, the, you know, the phrase that I use internally is we think of learning as being on the income statement. In my view, it's a balance sheet issue. It's not a cost versus uh, a revenue. It's actually what we're doing is increasing the, the asset, the, the, the size of our balance sheet. It's an, it's an asset, it's an intangible asset. And learning uh, ought to be increasing um, organizational value and actually building a competitive advantage. So that's the first idea I want to share with you is this notion of we should be thinking about learning in a different way, having a, fit, having a growth mindset about learning. So that then takes you to the question that could be a bit abstract and you might say that sounds great James but what does that mean in practice or, or, or another you could ask the question so what then is learning for what does this you know solving problems strategic problems or designing processes what does that actually mean and so I want to share um, next uh, I want to answer that question and I think there are actually five things that learning can be for and here are the first two don't worry I'm not going to go through this entire slide but I want to set up the way that we're thinking about it rather conceptually. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a way of helping to understand the question uh, or the answer to the question, what is learning for? So what problems are we solving? Where and how is value created? What does the learning function actually do? What is learned? Who has authority to execute? I want to come back to that question when it comes to politics. What's the, the value of the learning function itself? And then, you know, what could happen, which actually I noticed here is a replication of the learning function activity. So forgive me for that. So there are the three, they're the six kind of key questions. And I think learning is for, for five things or learning can be applied in five different ways. And let's start with individual improvement, which I've just referenced, which is the most traditional way of thinking about learning. It's about skills. How do we, you know, how do we improve manager effectiveness? So how do we help our experts you know, in my industry, how do we make sure that our valuation skills of our analysts are, you know, industry leading? That's really about effectiveness. It's improving skills. And as a CLO, I can, I can, um, I can commission and execute that learning. The second level of learning is actually, instead of at the level of individual, it's at the level of a team. And the question, the problem there may be actually, how do we improve team effectiveness? How do local teams work more effectively together? The value creation is about efficiency and alignment. Obviously, there are more team-based interventions. I need the support of a business leader to do that. And the role of a learning professional is that primarily of a coach. Also, we introduce this notion of being an architect. How do you, how do you create experiences that drive innovation and learning in a team? So that's the second thing that learning is for. The third thing, and now this is the top of the left-hand column, is I think it's interesting to see uh, learning, I, I referenced this briefly earlier, as actually driving operational performance. So what this is really about is, is functional processes. How do we improve processes to drive alignment? So this could be, for example, I worked for a huge engineering company 10 years ago about how do we improve safety in the field? This was a, a, a um, hundreds of thousands of people in this organization. How do we uh, use learning to drive safety? That's an example of that. Or digital transformation is another um, oper key operational process where learning professionals were asked to lean in. This is about many things, but including speed of execution and strategy execution. The interventions look slightly different. They're not skills workshop. They're almost labs or initiatives. We, we, we learners act as, excuse me, learning professionals act as consultants, strategists, facilitators, and really what's, what's improved is, is, is the optimization of the value chain, of the value chain. The, on the, on the right-hand side, we then move from the bottom line to the top line and say, actually, 
how can learning be used for value creation at the top line? So how do we, and this is where we move outside of the organization into the ecosystem and say, well, actually, can we use learning to align with our customers, to align with supplier relationships? Can we drive growth and innovation? Can we drive the top line? Activity here might, might take a, a variety of, um, uh, might be external inquiry, idea generation. Um, there may be workshops on, uh, we're developing a program called Win For All, which is about how do we all get what we want? It, in a way, it's a kind of negotiation would be some of the content under the hood, but we don't frame it in that way. That really needs to be sponsored by the CEO uh, or, or, or a general manager of a business unit. But again, what, what we're trying to do is push this notion, push the assumptions of what learning is for. And for us, having learning driving top line results is an interesting and a, a, an, an exciting space to be. The last is what we call ecosystem transformation, which forgive the business jargon. But what we're really getting at here is all levels one to four that I've described so far really position learning within the company. And a question that I'm interested in Goldman Sachs is, for a learning function, how can we help develop not just the leadership of Goldman Sachs, but leadership by Goldman Sachs? Which is to say, what would it look like to apply a learning lens to the question of, well, what's the role this organization institution has in the system in which it operates? And so, uh, an example here at the top, you know, how could, how could, how could, um, how could we catalyze the industry to have an, a real environmental agenda? Or what's the corporate sector's role in the questions of race, um, equality, diversity, and, and inclusion? You know, those are system-wide questions where learning needs to be sponsored by you know, industry coalitions or boards, but learning has a key role to play in that. And so back to this question of strategy, the, the, the fundamental questions we're asking is, you know, how do we shift from a fixed to a growth mindset about what the learning function is and where it plays? And then how do we expand the notion of what learning, what learning is for? I want to move on to the third idea of execution. And this is, this is rather simple. I wrote a, a short article with a, with, a, with a colleague on this. And I don't know that it's, it's particularly groundbreaking, but I'll share where we are with it. When we talk with stakeholders or, or leaders who want they want to commission learning, we notice that they're very focused on what to teach. You know, they need to learn negotiation skills, or they need to learn agility, or they need to learn curiosity, or they need to learn, you know, skill, digital skills, Python, whatever it is. And there's a big focus on the what and a big focus on the how. And this is obviously where the digital agenda is, is very significant, particularly at Goldman, we're a little bit behind the curve in respect of our digital learning. Again, I'm happy to speak about that. But actually for us, the more interesting questions and the more important questions when it comes to actual impact on the ground are questions of who, where, and when. And I've, 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 I've especially if you go back to that learning, that there's five scales of, of what learning is for, actually in some way, who is obviously important, but, but we're really moving towards, you know, how do, we, how do we learn in teams and in and with teams so shifting from the individual to more of an organizational impact. And in fact, how do we think of teams even as a building blocks of several parts of learning? And so an example of that would be, we, we launched a program last year. Most of our programs are, uh, individuals are nominated or selected based on either a role, for example, after a new promotion or, um, or performance or potential, for example, a high potential program. But for the first time last year, we identified individuals actually because by virtue of their position in relation to major initiatives. And so the, 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 the discussion with the president of the firm was, which are the dozen or so initiatives at the firm, the success of which will create outsized impact for Goldman Sachs? You know, where's change really happening? Where's the 80-20? We identified, in fact, 15. And we then invited the leaders and some of the senior teams of those initiatives to engage in a process of, of accelerating impact. So it's an example of, of looking actually first at the who. Where, where uh, the question of where I think is important because this is kind of essentially getting out of the classroom into the real world of work. And there's a lot that's written about the flow of work. And then when is, um, we're thinking a lot at the moment about the, li the life cycle of our employees, but the life cycle of our businesses. And again, taking it out of the lens of the who and into the when. So when do people learn best? When are they most receptive? For example, after a major transition, when a new manager comes, after a new strategy is announced, and how do we use those as inflection points for learning? 
So I've discussed mindset, what's learning for an execution. I'd like now to talk about a little bit about politics. Um, and there are two things that I'd like to say here, and then I'm going to draw breath and, and, and take your and take some questions. So the first thing that I thought about uh, that I've been thinking a lot about is the role of learning in HR. And by the way, I'm in HR. I sit on the uh, the global executive committee of our HR function at Goldman Sachs. I'm an HR professional. And when it, and as, as Nick said, I have a talent role within which learning sits. I'm also the chief learning officer and with that hat. I've been wondering about essentially where should the learning function sit in an organization? What are the benefits of being in HR and what are potentially some of the drawbacks? And you'll notice that the branding of this document, you'll notice in the top left hand side, it says Pine Street and underneath that Goldman Sachs, just a word on Pine Street. Pine Street is the group within Goldman Sachs whose, whose remit is the development of the, the most senior leaders in the firm, which is to say the partners of the firm and the partner pipeline. And it's, it's one of the only functions in the firm whose name is a metaphor. Now, Pine Street is a symbol as well as a function. And it's a symbol because Pine Street is a real place. It's two blocks north of Wall Street in downtown Manhattan. And it's where Marcus Goldman set up shop at 30 Pine Street 151 years ago. And so naming the leadership development group uh, of the firm after the birthplace of the firm speaks to the importance of history and culture and the expectations of our leaders. So even as we drive forward in innovation and change, it's important to be rooted in the history of the culture and the values of the firm. And that's what the name represents. It's a symbol as well as a function. Now, Pine Street has in various guises been in what's called the executive office, which is the chairman's office, and also in the HR group. And I've been reflecting on the benefits and drawbacks of having learning in HR. For me, putting learning in HR, um, the, the huge benefit is you, you're part of an integrated talent agenda. And if you see learning in terms of skills and behaviors and a focus on individuals and by the way, teams, that makes perfect sense. But I've been wondering if you want to apply learning to a more strategic or a broader effort, for example, top line revenue generation, ecosystem transformation, even operational processes. I've been wondering about the drawbacks of, of trying to do that from within HR. And I think what I've put on screen on, on oh, you'll see now on slide 12, is some purposefully provocative um, caricature of what it's like to work in HR, what HR professionals, how they might show up. So a lot of HR professionals aiming to please customers see learning actually as training, not, not, in the, not in the way that I've been discussed. They tend to have a fixed mindset. May, if, if HR folk are commissioning learning, um, may have rather a narrow sense of what's possible. Often HR is a junior a department within a firm. And so is it possible to challenge the you know, most senior leaders in the firm and drive a strategic agenda if, if that is the case politically? Um, and so, it's just a question I'm asking, you know, I'm asking myself is how do we how do we drive a strategic agenda from an organization that often has some of these characteristics? Um, uh, and so that's a part of being politics. The other part of being politics, and this is the last place, uh, last uh, comment I'd like to make as I was reflecting on, again, the learning that I've had as a chief, chief learning officer is um, and I've come across many learning people. That, and I think there are really two questions for learning professionals, in particular senior learning professionals, is, is what's your orientation and what's your posture? And um, what I really mean by that is, by orientation, I, and my own belief, coaching, you know, as Nick mentioned, I, I'm an executive coach. That's actually a big part of my work still. When I coach with leaders, I'm developing a hypothesis that leaders tend to have... Um, a certain posture, a, a sort of assumption about their starting point. And it's either up, managing up, across their peers, down, they manage the team, or out, this client oriented. None is good and none is bad. It, my assumption is that, that leaders tend to sort of to orient one way and then have to, um, a bit like a compass, tend to point one way and then make sure that they're compensating and, and acting effectively in the other three. And I think it's a very important question for as a chief learning officer, what is your orientation? What, what, what is it? And, and, and how does that affect your posture? So if you think of the orientation as kind of a space, I think of posture as um, um, 
you know, this is really about do you show up as a as a commercial leader? Do you have the strategic or commercial agenda of the firm front in mind as you're interacting in the organization? Or are you more organizationally focused? You know, is your concern, for example, culture, values? How inclusive are we here? Um, how, how welcoming are we to new ideas? Or is it, is it, you, do you have a people orientation? Which is to say, are you focused on skills and performance and potential and focusing on the individual and making sure that individuals kind of are, 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 are unleashed? Again, I don't think any of those is bad or good, but I do believe we have kind of a preferred posture I think we have a preferred posture and orientation. And for me, as I, as, I, as I meet other chief learning officers and other learning professionals, I think that it's important to um, be aware and intentional about your posture and your orientation when you're looking to influence in the firm and to make sure that you're speaking the language, the a commercial language, and that you're noticing your orientation in order to drive results. So I think these questions are important, one for influence, but two for execution. And so it's for me, it's the awareness and the intentionality about these that help manage what is rather a complex role, which Nick and I have spoken about. And we can speak about these these um, in subsequent questions. But the CLO role is, is often, I think, poorly defined is up to the individual to define it and to make it. And so the questions of orientation and posture are, are to me, two fundamental ways in which you define that role and are the basis, again, for influence and, and execution. So that's it. Those are five things I've thought about. I've thought about the mindset of learning from fixed to growth. I've thought about what is learning for, and I've given five examples. I've been thinking about execution and how do you bring that to life. I've been thinking about uh, should learning be in HR? What's the right organizational place for learning? And then lastly, I thought about how do you define the CLO role and how do you make it effective? How do you, um, how do you get a seat at the table um, in the way that you're executing, in the way that you're formulating and then executing agenda? So those are the five things I've been thinking about. I'm going to draw breath for the reasons I shared earlier. Uh, I've done a lot of learning and preparation for this. And I would love to hear your questions and comments and, and, and get into dialogue with you about what's most important to you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, James. Um, so this is uh, you know, a lot of food for thought. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for sharing all of this. And um, you know, I will ask people to uh, use the chat and to, uh, to post your questions. Um, you know, I, I will start, uh, James, you know, also reflecting on kind of, the, you know, we had discussions on this, the, the role of the CLO, the future role of the CLO, the competencies of the CLO, uh, and just, you know, kind of a, a question for yourself, you know, you have, you have studied different fields uh, uh, during your career, and which field do you believe, you know, uh, makes a big difference for yourself as, as a head of talent CLO? What a, that's a really interesting question. You mean the fields that I've studied? Yeah, yeah, classics, you know, MBA, and then psychotherapy, yeah. psychology, coaching. So what's kind of, you know, what do you say, you know what, based on what I do and my thinking, et cetera, yeah. has the biggest impact in shaping me as, a, as an executive in, in, in talent and, and, and learning and development? Yeah, it's not one thing. It's, it's pro I mean, I, I, it's probably the, inter the interconnectedness of things rather than one field and in fact i was talking just yesterday with a with a team member who aspires to be an executive coach and, and she was a little despondent how long is it going to take me and how am i going to get there and my own journey it only looks linear in the rearview mirror at the time it was very it's very unclear it's very unclear to me i never thought I'd, I'd get this job and it was very unclear even how to get into the field and i think that i the reason i've I think the reason I've continued to grow is because of the connections between. So, for example, history is very. Is, is, I do think I'm going to come back to the importance of history, but history probably is the number one thing that's important. But at the same time, I've studied, as you say, um, even like process reengineering at NCAD, a course I thought would be dull as ditch water and very useless, turned out to be extremely enlightening. And then you put that together with some of the work, you know, some psychology or psychotherapeutic training. Each, each gives light to each other in an unexpected way. And so I, I do think variety, it's, it's the interconnectedness that's, that's probably the key. Having said that, I don't want to dodge your question. If you, if you made me choose one, I would choose history. And I would choose history. And I, I know that um, the, the liberal arts are getting a bit of a hard time at the moment, and it's all about STEM. 
and uh, you know that's the future. But for me, history uh, is 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 forever a teacher, and it teaches different. It's for me, it's taught me different different lessons depending on where I am in my life, you know, and about my age and my stage uh, of my career. But the ability the ability to uh, uh, to distinguish fact from opinion, to marshal to marshal evidence into a story to debate and see the other side, um, and then to, to stand on the shoulders of, of so many others who came before you and to, and to learn from them. Th th those, I think, are, are, are meta skills, which are, which are really crucial. And so that, for that reason, I'd, if I choose one, it would be history. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, James, for that. Yeah, a lot of food for thought for many of us, right? So in terms of you know, where we can expand our learning uh, over time. Um, James, another question, um, you know, that's, that comes to mind of many kind of CLOs um, is typically like, yes, you know, we have learning, we have learning initiatives or in our organizations, interventions, uh, but, you know, a lot, you know, kind of a lot of focus need to be on the learning culture, right, or learning yeah. climate. Um, can you say something about, you know, the learning, what's the learning climate, you know, at Goldman Sachs, you know, yeah, you are hiring smart people and, you know, so, so what, what's the culture of learning at, at Goldman's, Goldman, Goldman and what's working and what's not working? Yeah. I love, uh, yeah, that's a great question, Nick, to be clear, <laughs> Osmo Goldman isn't great, but the, the, the point, the point you're making in your question, I, I, I think is exactly right. <laughs> So look, I mean, I think Goldman is a, a big learning culture. The words, the language is very important in organizations. The words we tend to, we talk a lot about the apprenticeship culture. Yeah. And so, and in fact, our CEO, one of the reasons he's been very public about having people return to the office is in his view, you just learn better when you're together. It's, it's apprenticeship is, is very hard by Zoom and it happens organically and instinctively when you're together. And so it's a very uh, apprenticeship based culture. There's a strong focus on uh, on new hires, particularly those in university. How do we get them up to speed? How do we develop them and how do they learn? So in that sense, it's and it's a very, I would say, inquisitive and information hungry organization. So a, apprenticeship is big and people always want to know, which I guess in fun, I guess that's the, I guess that's literally being in the market. You want to have you want to know all the information. Yeah, so those things are those things are. Yeah, I think are working very well. I think the things that are working less well. I think there are two things that are working less well. One, believe it or not, I don't often use the word learning. Uh, I know it's in my title, uh, and I know it's the subject of many of our studies. I don't often use that word because my experience is within Goldman, and, and by the way, in other companies too, learning has a bit of a. Um, it's not a very high value activity, actually. It feels formal. It feels um, dutiful. Uh, and I think it goes back to this fixed mindset. It has notions of sitting in a classroom, feeling exposed, feeling a bit vulnerable. Um, and not, you know, and, and, and Goldman, like many of the institutions represented by people on this call today, are full of you know, ambitious, high achieving people who want to get on and create results. And the link between learning and results is unclear. And so the word I tend to use more often is performance, or uh, sometimes I talk about development. I think everyone gets the value of coaching now. So sometimes we speak about coaching. Um, we speak a lot about uh, potential and achievement and, and delivering results. So, but I really, I really always come back to performance. Yes. So, and I, and I think that's, I think it's okay. But when you said in terms of what we can do better, I think we could, I th you know, one of the things that I would like to do is um, is, our, is is have a closer connection between our formal learning activity and this strong apprenticeship culture and actually see them as two sides of the same coin. And by the way, some of the branding around Pine Street is purposeful in order to position learning as a, as a quote, high status activity rather than a low status activity. We can speak more about that. It's something I, I, I think a lot about is how do you, how do you, how do you position this effectively? But fundamentally, the thing I think Goldman can do can do better is have is have the formal and informal a bit close, a bit more closely together. Number one. Number the other thing I think we can do better is expand expand the notion of what we're learning. 
uh, and so I think as people are very quick, that people love to know, often love to know uh, facts, information, models. I remember being astonished when I joined the firm. Um, you know, what are the top 10 tips on this? You know, just give me the answer about that. It's a very short attention span place. I think we can get better at reflection. So, and, and I think we all know, and, and you know, the power of reflection and learning, the power of slowing down, discussing, dialogue, discuss, you know, uh, evaluating other points of view. I think that, that that's something, again, I'd like to, uh, I think we could improve. Yeah, thanks for James. Um, so um, in terms of leadership developments, um, what, what are some of the, you know, you believe are, are key competencies for the future? that leaders at Golden, Goldman Sachs need to be developed? Yeah. We're actually right in the middle of asking that question. So it's very timely. Um, and um, I mean, it kind of goes to what I, 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 I think the key, in a way, the key, I think the key, I think there are two or three key concepts that I think are important. The first is um, Gold, Goldman, I think like a lot of organizations tend, tend to suffer from attribution error, which is to say, tends to think that individuals perform well because of their own ability. It's a, it's a we use the, the metaphor athlete to describe individuals who are performing strongly over a long period of time. So it tends to be a place where you know, individuals are cultivated very strongly. I think one of the key capabilities of leaders of the future is understand the notion and the skill of creating environments within which others perform. And so, for example, some of the work of Barry Oshry around seeing systems or Bert mm -hmm. Hellinger with systemic constellations, which I know are completely left field in most corporations, I think actually should become mainstream. How do we take a more systemic view to our role uh, uh, as being a leader? And how, I think Barry Oshry calls it, says leaders suffer from system blindness or, or, or context blindness because we see individuals outside of their context. So I think the first thing is understanding the context. Um, uh, in the context and the, and the systemic you know, role of leadership. I think, that's, I think that is probably the single biggest capability because from that comes you know, all sorts of other you know, advantages around inclusion and innovation and agility and a lot of the competencies that we speak about. I actually see those as second order. The issue is not how do you develop those in individuals, it's how do you develop those organizations. To do that, you need leaders who can see and understand a systemic way of leading. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sir James. And you know, in terms of the, um, the how in leadership development, so over the last you know, 15 months, everybody has gone online. Um, and there are a lot of discussions in organizations, as you refer to, about the future of work in terms of, you know, do we expect people to come back to the office, yes or no, and if, yeah. um, for how many days? But there's also discussion about, you know, leadership programs, you know, should they, should they continue to be 100% online, or is there still a place for bringing people together? And yeah, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, G Goldman's big on, big on in-person contact. Because, and, and my, my, you know, the firm would say, you know, again, our CEO has been very public about that. He speaks about it in terms of the culture. I, I actually think a big, a very big um, benefit of learning interventions uh, are, are social. Back to this point about it's not, I think the individual stuff you know, can happen at a desk through a webinar or, or LXP or whatever that, you know, we can speak with. But I think when we have a program, it's, it's, it's based on a cohort and, and the notion of binding people to each other, to the firm, creating bonds across regions, divisions that wouldn't otherwise exist are extremely powerful. Because you don't have to be in person to do that, but it's, it's easier to do it in person. Yeah. And so, we, we, so that, you know, that is our preference, particularly because we're a very collaborative firm in general. But, but because, we're, because I mean, I've alluded to some of this already, it's very fast paced, it's very intense conversations tend to be like this. And I think what learning is, is almost unique in providing a space for conversations to be like this. And for those maybe that can't see me, I, I, I'm suggesting that learning provides a space for a broader, uh, more reflective space. It actually goes back to what I said about making connections between fields. I think those connections can only happen 
when you have the space to do that. And I think that's that is just difficult to do on it's possible but difficult to do online. So our, our we have rather a traditional view on that, and our preference is that you know on balance better to be in person. Thanks, Sir James. Uh, I got one more question in the chat actually um, on, um, on on the what and this and you refer to uh, learn you know learning curiosity. Um, what are the things? What what are you doing at Goldman Sachs to to help people to you know kind of develop their level of curiosity? Yeah, that's such a great that's such a great question. Um, so I think we're doing. Let me think. We're doing we're doing two or three things. We have um, one of the big shifts this year. You know, a lot of learning, as you know, is focused on or, or, or change in organizations is focused on behavior. We're, the, 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 we're, we're, we're um, our skills and behavior. We're trying something new this year, which is a, a different focus on process through some of the talent processes. And specifically, what we're introducing is a, a process calling three conversations at Goldman Sachs, three conversations at GS, where we're strongly encouraging, we're not mandating, but we're strongly encouraging everyone in the firm to sit down with the manager three times during the course of the year to review goals, progress, and feedback. And as part of that, there's a wealth of information and, and, and uh, big firm-wide town halls and 6,000 people on a call and, uh, and handouts and PDFs and all the rest of it, a ton of materials. And that, that is a significant, actually underlying that emphasis on the role of a manager, on the role of a coach, un underlying all of that is a focus on, on curiosity and openness to the other person's experience. So I say that's one thing we're doing kind of formally through a talent process. I also think through um, our continued focus on diversity and inclusion, there's also a very strong focus on curiosity. I mean, through, through you know, I think led largely by the black community in the, in the US in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, but now through many other communities across the firm, there's much more willingness to be vulnerable and open about your experience. And on the other side of that, much more willingness and openness to be curious, in fact, desire to be curious to learn. And so I think, you know, there's a talent process driver. I think DNI has been a big driver for curiosity. And then lastly, and maybe expected in many, in, I think in almost all of our programs, we uh, we speak about um, uh, curiosity and and, uh, and openness to learning. And actually, we use, we, we, and in fact, I was thinking about it just as we began, because most often when I begin a session, I'll begin with a short breathing exercise, because we, we use the breath and breathing and presencing as a, a kind of core skill of cu uh, underlying curiosity. Yeah, wonderful, uh, wonderful, James. Um, so, so you spoke about also the value of, of learning. Um, and as, as we know, like in many organizations, there are a lot of discussions about, you know, impact, you know, uh, the creation of value, ROI, you know, measurement. Can you say a couple of words about that? So, so what do you need to prove at Goldman Sachs? You know, do you need to have, uh, here are the ROI yeah. numbers? Or like, no. Yeah. So, so what, what kind of, uh, it also relates to the culture and, and the leadership support for, for capability development, for culture, for values. Yeah. Say a little bit about that. It's such a great question. I know a lot of professionals you know, I know we, we, we think about that the whole time. Here's the, here's the, I'll give you the, I'll give you the, I will in a moment speak about how we, how we measure, how we think about measurement, but the truth of it is there's far more demand on our function than there is supply. So we're not actually in the business of, um, we very rarely get asked to justify our existence. I mean, I, in fact, now that I think about it, I, I can think that's almost never, that's not the posture the firm has to what we're doing at all. It's not like, you know, well, if you don't show that's valuable, then we'll get rid of it. I think there's so much, you know, the like an economic model of demand that we supply, the price goes up. I don't know whether the price of learning is going up in the firm or the value is going up in the firm, but there's a big demand. And, and I think that, and, and so we, we, in fact, when I became a chief learning officer, we, we implemented a new way of measurement that I'll speak about, but the way we did that was primarily to learn not to justify. We wanted to know which programs are effective and which aren't and why. And so to make it very, very simple, 
our, our idea was creating, we call that the learning value chain. Can we create a model that starts with the inputs, how much a program costs, both in terms of extra materials, but also the, the you know, vendors, but also just the time and the salaries of the learning team. Can we, can we do that for each program? What's the cost? Can we look at the short-term metrics? Can we, for example, um, was it time well spent, net promoter score and so on? Can we link that to longer-term metrics? For example, increase in performance, retention and so on. And then can we link that what is the economic value of those metrics to the firm? And we wondered, could we, could we literally create like a dollar to dollar value chain? The short answer is not yet, but it's something we're thinking about. And it's the way we think about actually what it is we're trying to do. We think about it in those commercial terms. The core methodology we use is a net promoter score. Uh, and we implement for, ev for everything we do, there's a standard set of questions which we ask in order to have comparability across programs. Of course, each program will ask different things as well. But there's a standard as a standard set but again we use that for our own learning uh in terms of the 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 effectiveness of programs that, that that by which the firm judges it there are really two things one we're happy with one we're not the, the thing we're happy with is uh people are less interested in, in the so-called happy sheet results and the more interested in what happens to this class so if we have a you know hyper, we have a for example a, a very well regarded program for our high potential who will be considered for partner, how many of that group become partners and what's their performance over the longer term. So we track that. The thing we're less happy about is honestly, this is the sound bites. Someone will say to their manager or a division head, this was a great program and suddenly, oh, you know, this will ring through the organization. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, we talk a lot, we communicate a lot. And so the sound bites sometimes get ahead. Almost always that's great for us, but it's not very forensic. It's not very scientific. And so, uh, that's not really where we're focused. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, it's great hearing that, uh, James. Um, a little bit related to this, um, you know, in our field, uh, the, the big hype is all about uh, data and analytics and predictive analytics. And uh, I had a chance to talk with um, a leader at Amazon on this topic as well uh, weeks ago. Um, and there's also a question in the chat uh, today. Um, any, any thoughts on this, you know, for the learning in you know, a people function, you know, kind of where are you in terms of analytics, predictive analytics? You know, where do you see things going, actually? So uh, let me talk it. Let me give you the firm answer, then leave you my answer. So the firm answer is we're, we're, we're all in. In fact, we hired a, a co-chief information officer so to lead our 10,000 person engineering organization, a third, a quarter of the firm from Amazon. So we're very familiar with the Amazon ways of practices and we're, we're, we're data hungry. And we're actually undertaking right now an HR transformation throughout you know, the entire division, a large part of which is creating a single data lake and the infrastructure to you know, allow us to gather and interpret and analyze and use the insights in this data. And we've implemented a new people listening approach that I'm happy to speak about, but so you know, we're, we're all into the data. My, my own view, so, so yes, that's super important. My own view is, I think we can, honestly, I think we can overdo it. Uh, and when I say we, when I say we can overdo it, um, I think, and it kind of goes back to that, you know, the, the argument I'm making for the power of history. I think there's many ways to interpret to, to interpret data, and I, I want to be just cautious about um, the the frames we put around people and what we look for in people. And I don't want through our use of analytics to reduce wonderful, colourful individual human beings to um, it's kind of categories. And so I just want to find the right balance between you know, remaining, you know, remaining rooted in, the, in the, the human experience at work, but also having superior insights into what that's like. And I, I think in organizations tend to move away from the human towards the, towards the machine as, 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 a, as, a, as a metaphor that we often speak about. And so I want to keep a foot in the human camp. And I think actually as learning professionals, that's our job in a way is to, is to represent and advocate for that. Um, and so I'm wholly supportive of the agenda, but that would be the kind of the caveat, the thing that I think we need to watch for. I also think it's a reflection of learning. Uh, it tends more to come from the fixed mindset view of learning where we need to, it's about cost, it's about individuals, it's about skills, all of which is great. But as we move to a more, I hope, progressive view of learning, I think yeah. there'll be different data around that. Yeah, yeah. No, I like it a lot, uh, James. Um, 
Uh, another question, uh, you know, you, you spoke about, um, you know, when we think about the, 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 the learning function, about strategy, about execution, about politics. Uh, and what I really like, actually, is that also what you shared, that you, you spent quite a bit time yourself in, in coaching executives. And I, I believe that as, as, as executives in L&D, you know, it's important that we are still you know, kind of part of the, the basic, the foundational business process and that we are in touch with our uh, customers, our clients in the organization. Yeah. My, my question is, uh, if you look at, you know, kind of, you know, strategy, execution, politics and, and coaching and potentially, I assume, also being involved in leadership development programs, how much time as a percentage do you spend on what? Yeah. Um, so I, early this year, I became a head of talent. So as well as all of that, I now am responsible for recruiting. And so honestly, I'm, 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 I completely agree with you, Nick. You know, my, I, I think it's critical to be a practitioner. And regretfully, over the past few months, I spent less time as I've become to be with our recruiting function. But my, my ideal is, you know, I think, I think the job is basically three things. It's, it's basically managing, you know, a team. I think it's setting strategy and connecting with stakeholders. And then I think it's quote unquote, the work and the work yeah. can be coaching, speak, facilitating, teaching, writing, it could be a number of other things. My, my aim would for that would be for that to be a third of my, a third, a third of my, roughly a third, a third, a third. Uh, so that would be my aim, if not more. It's the thing I love. It's the thing that it's really the thing I love. It's why I said yes to your invitation to be amongst this group and to spend time with these professionals. It's you know it is the work I love. Um, but the pleasure and pain of these of these roles, I'm really you know you kind of get elevated. You know they you get elevated. You know and it's it's very classic. And as we know, professional service firms as well. You know they take the lead lawyer, and the lead lawyer becomes the. So anyway, I'm, I'm right in the middle of that. So my aim is a third. The reality is much less than that. But I hope that as the year goes through and we, we you know, I, I, I kind of get in the swing of this talent role, then it will, it will move back to, to you know, higher towards the third. Yeah, well, thanks. That's, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's terrific, uh, James. And my last question, of course, is about time. Um, you know, if you reflect on, you know, what you have done at uh, Goldman Sachs over the years, what is the, the one thing you are most proud of? Uh, I'm most proud of establishing our function as serious and credible through the team. I think it's a great team. Yeah. So in a way, that's two answers in one. But, yeah. but, 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 but you know, I think we're... You know, I think, yeah, I do. We've, we've got a call into anybody in the firm. You know, anybody takes our call, takes our meetings, he listens to what we have to say. I think we've got, you know, we do have a seat at the table and I think it's because we've got a great team. So it's, I think it's really that. I think it's easy to dismiss, would be easy to dismiss, uh, but I don't think we are. So that's really what I'm proud of. Yeah. James, you know, thank you so much for um, for this uh, dialogue uh, today, for sharing your thoughts. You are a great thinker, um, and you know, I think it's exciting actually. What you also help to uh, elevate, you know, the profession, not just at Goldman Sachs, but also uh, what's happening in other organizations. And I think uh, both of us are on the same page. And it's so important that we help organizations, help people to go to the next level, um, the next uh, the next decade. So thank you so much for uh, for your time. Uh, thank for you. Everything. Uh, absolute, um, absolute pleasure. Yeah, and and thanks everyone for dialing in uh, today. Um, we look forward to seeing some of you back in uh, in a couple of weeks for our next webinar. So stay in touch. Um, be well. Stay healthy. And um, look forward to seeing you next time. All the best. Take care now. Thanks. Uh,